This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. What's up, Detroit sports fans? Welcome to the Fan Report, a show made by fans for fans, powered by the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. I'm Nick, and with me, Sanders, going to give us this week's topics. This has been playing pretty damn well as of late. We're in three of the last four as of recording this podcast. We're going to dive into it. It's a fan report. So since the All-Star break, pretty much, we've, we've kind of been seeing a little bit of a new Leaf basketball for the Pistons mm-hmm. that is worlds apart from what we were seeing from this team early on in the year, yeah. which is really the only opportunity we've gotten to see this team play with all of Cade, Sadiq, and Jeremy Grant together. And it was only a handful of games because Cade missed a lot of time to begin the year to begin with. Mm-hmm. So... And when Jeremy Grant came back at first, it wasn't looking too hot. And Cade was hurt for some of that also. So yep. we, we really haven't gotten to see this team play mm-hmm. at full go with with all three of its main with its main three guys as of right now. Mm-hmm. And we're starting to get to see a little bit of that. Now, I know, Andrew, you and I on the show have long been saying that we don't believe Jeremy Grant is a future of this franchise. We don't believe he can be a guy that we can rely on long term. But has the play as of late from those three, who all three have played very well, mm-hmm. has that changed your tune at all? I mean, watching Jeremy Grant specifically last night, I mean, just like most of his time with the Pistons, he showed that he can score. And we know he can score. But the issue still persisted in terms of the tunnel vision that he gets. And it seemed like even when he wanted to try, like there were some times that he'd drive the lane and and then like it would pop in and said, "Oh, I should probably try to make a play here," but it was always the wrong pass. <laughs> like, right. Um, but he no, like see things out of his own penetration. Well, that's for yeah. sure. But my whole thing is, I just I feel like him and Sadiq Bay, all the they're showing they might actually be able to coexist. I still feel it's a bit redundant in terms of is it necessary to tie up as much money as we're going to have to tie up in Jeremy Grant. Like, is that what we need to move forward or is our money better spent elsewhere? And I'm still the belief that Jeremy Grant is not going to be the guy you want to tie up that money in long term. And you, you're better off spending that money, maybe securing a big man or securing a legitimate scorer, three level threat. I mean, Jeremy Grant is no slouch from three, but he's also not like a, knockdown shooter out there so yeah i i just i'm of the belief that the money can be better spent elsewhere My, even with what i've been seeing and yeah don't get me wrong i've i've obviously liked a lot of what i've seen from jeremy grant and the trio as of the last few games but my concern is knowing that we're going to hopefully and in all mm-hmm. likelihood have a top three pick and land one of the guys that we want to add to this roster Mm -hmm. knowing that you're looking at Jeremy Grant at best being the fourth guy on this team when they're ready to win. Mm -hmm. Because Sadiq Bey is proving he's number two right now. He's number Mm -hmm. two, which will probably push him back to number three in the pecking order once this draft comes through, which would push Jeremy Grant back to number four. Well, looking around the league at winning teams, who are the number four guys on most of those teams? Well, you look at guys like Robert Covington. Or Danny Green, or mm-hmm. you know, list other name here of a guy who plays primarily as a three and D guy. Yes, Jeremy Grant is far better than those guys and would play that role far better. But you're tying up a lot of money in one player to be the fourth, the number four guy in your roster, and he doesn't really work as a number two or three option mm-hmm. because of the fact that he just he try he essentially makes your number one guy not as effective when he has the ball. And that's a problem. And I don't think a team that has Jeremy Grant as their number two or three score or number two or three option is going to win anything because of that, because he doesn't make his teammates better necessarily. He's a good player. You'll have nights like last night against Charlotte where just get him the rock. He's going to score. He's going to find a way to score. Um, But yeah, it's that that is not necessarily always conducive to winning. No. Um, especially when you're talking about a guy who's become a bit of a ball stopper in Jeremy Grant. 
Right. I just I don't personally see Jeremy Grant working and gelling with this team in a way that has him being mm-hmm. happy with his role one, mm-hmm. two being worth the money for his role, and three it, it working out because of the presence mm-hmm. of guys like Cade, Sadiq, and whoever we bring in f- through this draft. Like I just. Jeremy Grant just he's a good player and I like him a lot. I just don't think he's gonna fit long term because of the presence of what else is there. Because he does play a very similar role to Sadiq Bay. And yeah, I do think you're going you know, if we do keep the same setup or if you know for throughout the rest of this year, we are gonna see more games like what we saw the other night where mm-hmm. all three of those guys put up 20 points. But I think some of that it's gonna be despite jeremy grant not yeah. so much because of mm-hmm. when sadiq bay scores 20 points a lot of it has to do with you know a lot of it is because of Cade cunningham i can't really but, say the same about that when it comes to jeremy grant and also with sadiq bay i mean you have to look at the assist numbers also specifically the month of february sadiq bay has been averaging over four assists a game which is something he wasn't really doing at all in his career up to this point he He's shown an improvement in finding his teammates, which gives him a leg up on Jeremy Grant on the wings. And also, he's scoring about as much as Jeremy Grant and doing it more efficiently, if you ask me. And I do think part of the reason his assist numbers have gone up is the fact that the Pistons are able to spread the ball around a little bit more. Before, mm-hmm. it was Caden Sadiq and nobody else. Well, now yeah. that Jeremy Grant's back in full swing, it's quite a bit harder to cover three guys who can score the rock mm-hmm. at one time. Like it's it's very difficult for defenses mm-hmm. to do that. So that opens things up for guys like Sadiq Bay to make the extra pass when they mm-hmm. could have just taken the shot. And and yeah, that is going to help the numbers. It's going to help guys like Jeremy Grant. The difference is though, Sadiq Bay is finding that extra pass. Jeremy Grant is not. And, yeah, and that's, exactly. that's the reason why Sadiq Bay, in my opinion, at least, is the long term solution in that's in this on this team because of that. Mm-hmm. And, and frankly, yeah. again, the role that we would have to have Jeremy Grant play, which he's a very good defender, very good defender. But offensively speaking, he's not a three point lights out shooter. He is a ball dominant type of player who needs the ball in his hands to be effective and that's just not what you need out of a guy who's your number at best, your number three option on the offense side of the ball. That that's not mm-hmm. what you want there. Yeah, like you look at Jeremy Grant's assist numbers in in the month of February, six out of his twelve games he's put up one or zero assists. Which I don't understand how you how that happens when you have guys who've shown they can score the ball playing right <clears throat> beside you in in uh, Sadiq Bay and Kay Cunningham, and you're playing thirty or more minutes a night. <laughs> I don't well, understand. It just shows you how much of a yeah. ball stopper he is. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, Sadiq Bay has zero games of zero one assists in the month of February. <laughs> right. And it goes to show how much he's been able to find the uh, the open man, make the extra pass, mm-hmm. and find the right guy. I mean, Sadiq Bay, in my opinion, is showing to be a more well rounded basketball player than Jeremy Grant is. Mm hmm. Sure, Jeremy Grant does things more consistently or at a higher level than Sadiq does right now. But I'm starting to see Sadiq make that, you know, kind of shorten that gap a little bit in those facets of the game yeah. and is widening the gap where he's better in others. And again, like, I don't want this to come off as like a Jeremy Grant hate segment, because if this was a different like this was a team at a different stage than it is now, I'd be all for keeping Jeremy Grant. But it's just we're we're a team that needs as much captain as possible to retain our young assets. and. Jeremy Grant is going to prevent that from happening. Right. I'll tell you right now, Sadiq Bey is probably not going to be that cheap when he, his Mm -hmm. deal is up and you're going to want to keep him. Like if he continues trending in the direction he's going, you're looking at a 15 to $20 million a year player. Mm -hmm. That's going to be tough to keep when you've got two number one picks on your team. Especially when you have Jeremy Grant's con I, I'd say it's probably impossible if you had Jeremy Grant's twenty five million dollar contract on there, but it it almost is kind of coming down to because you know damn well they're gonna want to keep Cade. Yeah. So they're gonna give him a max, probably. They're gonna want to keep whoever they get in the draft this year unless he doesn't pan out, which is entirely a possibility. But let's say Troy Weaver knows what he's doing, because I believe he does. You're gonna want to keep those two guys. 
you're probably going to want to sign some guys that make that are difference makers. Well, it's going to end up coming down to, do you want to keep Sadiq Bey or do you want to keep Jeremy Grant? Because they play very similar roles. And with the other expenses you have in your cap, that's probably what it's going to come down to. And frankly, my vote's Sadiq Bey. He's younger and he's more versatile. And I don't think he does anything that much worse than Jeremy Grant does. Now, moving on to the, I think, a major reason for this current winning. I don't want to call it win streak because it's not a win streak anymore, but just the winning three of the last Could four. Could have been a win streak, cause, but they blew the game <laughs> against Boston. Exactly. Uh, I, I really, I don't know about you, I feel like the addition of Marvin Bagley has opened up this offense so much. I've loved watching him play. It's, it's just different. Mm-hmm. He's energetic. He's fun. He brings something that we didn't have before down low. Mm-hmm. It's it's a level of athleticism that Kate has not yet been able to play with and gives him a legitimate role man, not named Isaiah Stewart. Even though I did read an article by James Edwards, uh, I think it was yesterday he put it out, but basically he was talking um, about Isaiah Stewart's proficiency in the highway screen, which is basically when you set a uh, set a pick for the uh, for the ball handler and then when you roll you basically set a second pick so that the ball handler can get to the rack without the usually the big man coming in and stopping his mm-hmm. regression and basically we just talking about how Isaiah Stewart has kind of mastered that and him mastered that has opened up the offense which is very true we actually but, they, they <laughs> highlighted that quite a bit in in the bot uh might have been the Charlotte game where Isaiah Stewart on his roll, going down low, mm-hmm. sealing off the big man so he can't come over and help. Exactly. And, like, that's I don't want to completely discount Isaiah Stewart in the in the no. pick-and-roll game. But, again, Marvin Bagley added a, has added a dimension to this offense that Kate hadn't been able to work with prior to this. And I know he didn't play against Charlotte, and we still won that game. Um, but I think a lot of that one was just pure offense there. But Well... The thing that Marvin Bagley brings that Isaiah Stewart doesn't really bring is a legitimate threat to get the ball and jam it down your throat. Like yeah, exactly. Isaiah Stewart doesn't really quite have that. Mm-hmm. He can do it, but Marvin Bagley is going to do it. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the difference there. And that's what Marvin Bagley's brought that I've really enjoyed is an energy and an athleticism level with a proficiency to score down low as well. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, we talked about this when they made the trade that this is a project. This is a, a reclamation project for Troy Weaver with Marvin Bagley. Is he going to work out? If not, that's OK. We didn't give up much. If he does, great. You may have found something in this guy because you got to remember, he was a number two pick just three or four short years ago. Yeah. Like he obviously has potential that's in there. And I think you're starting to see some of it come out here. So he does get slighted a ton for being the number two pick over guys like Doncic and Trey Young. But yeah, number now, two pick. My thought, you know, my whole thoughts going talking about Jeremy Grant and this team is looking at what we've what we've gotten, you know, what we've had mm-hmm. with Jeremy Grant, Cade, and Sadiq Bay this year. Knowing if if this is our team moving forward, and, and say we do keep Kate, say we do keep Jeremy Grant. And we add whatever to this team based on the drafts, knowing that that will likely mean we do not get anybody in free agency. Is that team good enough to win? And I'm going to sit here and tell you, I don't think so because of the fact that there is a disconnect between what Jeremy Grant does and what the rest of the team does. Mm -hmm. And also just looking at what they've done in the last few games. Yes, it's been good, but barely squeaking out a win over Charlotte. Like, I mean, barely because of Kelly O. Hey, hey, you broke the you broke the losing streak of one. No, we we'd lost like what 14, 15 in a row. To Charlotte, Charlotte was literally last night. I know. I said we'd lost fourteen no, or I, fifteen in a row. To I Charlotte. understand. I'm just <laughs> saying. But like looking at what this team has done with these three guys, yeah, it's not that impressive. And I know mm-hmm. guys like Caden Sadiq are gonna get better, but like how mm-hmm. much better is this team going to be? And that's where I say like. If this is what this team is, this isn't good enough to win. So I, I that's part of the reason I'm shying away from Jeremy Grant because I don't really like the disconnect I've seen with the rest of the team that he yeah. that he that he brings. 
but yeah, the re- like, but in all honesty, this isn't what the final product of this team is. No, you if are you, adding another draft yeah. pick, but who knows if he's going to pan out, what role he's yeah. going to play, what Jeremy Grant's role is going to be after that. Like, I'm going off of what I see and what I know now. Yeah. Because God, if you, know, I mean, God if you for- send Jeremy Grant, that's going to limit the amount that you can grow this team past this point. But it's going to end it. You add your draft pick and you're done. Like, that's your yep. team you're going to live and die by. Mm-hmm. So, is that, are you comfortable with that being the end product? And I'm saying, no, I'm not. Because yeah. I, no, I, I, I think the ceiling is too low with that team. Mm-hmm. But back to the Charlotte game, um, I think another standout piece for behind like the recent wins, I do think it's the energy that Killian has brought off the bench. This is the first time you'll compliment Killian in a while. I mean, obviously the scoring still is not there. I was going to say, it's still an absolute liability yeah. <laughs> shooting the ball. But like, you saw even specifically in the Charlotte game, Troy Weaver kept him in. I mean, not Troy Weaver. Uh, Dwayne Casey kept him in the game and uh, had him start overtime because of the defensive intensity he was bringing and how he was firing out the rest of the team. I, mean, I also think that had a little bit to do with the fact Corey Joseph couldn't hit water if he jumped out of a boat. That, that too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I saw I saw a tweet somewhere that said, like, uh, Killian Hayes would have hit Dwayne Casey with a left hook. <laughs> Corey Joseph came in on, in overtime over him. <laughs> yeah. Like, don't get me wrong. Killian Hayes played a good game against Charlotte. Mm-hmm. And he deserved to be in the ball game because Corey Joseph did not. Like, mm-hmm. like Kojo played a terrible game. He couldn't hit. He honestly, God, couldn't hit anything. Mm-hmm. And Killian was the right play. Killian and they finally has, had Killian inbounding on a game winning play. Like every single time. Thank we, God. I'm like, why is Katie buying still, the ball? Like, what is it? And they <laughs> still end up going to somebody like Kelly Olenek. <laughs> Hey, he was hot that night, though. He, he was. was hot He put last up night. 20 points. He outscored yeah. Cade. I yeah. Think. Which we'll get to Cade in a second. We will. But <laughs> I, like, I, I, I'm not dogging Killian Hayes at all. Like, hmm. I've, I've enjoyed the way that he's played the last few games. Like, he, mm-hmm. he's energetic off the bench. He facilitates well. He's starting to work a little bit better in the spots that he does get in the game with Cade. He brings mm-hmm. the energy defensively. He's played well. For what he is, he I, I'm still very weary of the shot never being able to fall because when it comes to that in this league, there just isn't a place for guys like that. Not not yeah. in this league. So that, that shot has to fall. But mm-hmm. I have liked what I've seen from Killian in the last few weeks just because of the fact that it's a different look for him. Like, like mm-hmm. he, he's he's essentially being a general of the floor. Like he, he's commanding the offense a little bit, not so much with his scoring ability or lack thereof, but by running the plays effectively and setting the right, you know, the making the right pass and finding a teammate. And he's done that very well. So I, Mm -hmm. I, again, I I like the way Killian has played. I still need to see him start knocking down those shots. Yeah. Um, I do. I do find it pretty interesting that I don't know if you um, have noticed how active Cade's trainer has been on Pistons Twitter, Ashen at Ashen the Trainer. I like. I remember when when the season first started. I'm like, oh no, are we going to have another like kind of like uh, Rich Ball? The, no, that's the agent. The the ball the ball the ball dad. Lavar, Lavar <laughs> Ball. I'm like, are we going to have another some situation like this where someone in Cade's camp is being way too vocal? But like, he's been like insanely like supportive of like Pistons fans. Like he's like trying to organize outings and shit. Anyway. <laughs> He uh, he tweeted a few days ago. He said uh, he really wants to work with Killian Hayes over the summer because he sees the potential. Uh, now, I I don't know how much you can do to help because the shot doesn't look broken. It just might be he doesn't have an offense. To speak um, of. <laughs> I'm also going to uh, say this. I'm not saying he's doing anything that bad, mm-hmm. but Cade's only shooting 40%. <laughs> Like, Cade's shot ain't exactly falling either, and it wasn't the other night. So, like, I don't know. <laughs> like, don't get but me you wrong. Know what? I like the I'm way willing Kate, to try I, anything. I know. I am, too. I, I love Cade. I love his game. I love what he does, and I know the shot's going to fall, but you get what I'm saying? Yeah, no. <laughs> I, I get what you're saying. Just don't have uh, Beeline work with him, please. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, <laughs> good old Johnny B. <laughs> so, honest question though, what do you think Kate, uh, not Kate, Killian's absolute ceiling is? I, you know, it's he's too young to tell. He's twenty years yeah, old. Like exactly, it, there we have no idea if this kid's gonna find find a shot in the off season. No clue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If he doesn't. Let's say he just maybe gets slightly better from, you know, shooting and just continues the path he's on. Mm -hmm. You could be looking at like a poor man's Rajon Rondo in his prime. A guy who is active Mm -hmm. defensively, not Mm necessarily. He's better defensively than Rajon was, but Mm Rajon was at least active defensively Mm -hmm. and is a good facilitator. He probably yeah, obviously wouldn't be Mm -hmm. quite as good of a shooter, even though Rajon wasn't a very good shooter. But Killian is that bad right now. Mm -hmm. And he's not quite at Rajon's facilitation level. No, either, but, but again, going <laughs> on the tra- going on the trajectory yeah. here, I think that's what he could be. Is like a, a, mm-hmm. a poor man's Rajon Rondo type of guy who's I can see good that. at facilitating, good mm-hmm. defensively, gets around the ball. It always seems to find a way to be around the ball when it's loose, and, and that's mm-hmm. something I've noticed with Killian is he's got so much energy and he's so active. Mm-hmm. He just finds ways to be around loose balls. Yeah. And no, I totally that's agree. exactly what Rajon Rondo was. He always mm-hmm. found a way to be whenever there was a loose ball. Rajon Ray, was the guy in the mix. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing for Killian to be. Is a guy like Rajon Rondo the most coveted player in the league of today? No. Mm-mm. But I mean, guy did win a title. But that's like that's his way of sticking in the NBA, though. Like if because I, I do feel like if he can't develop even the slightest semblance of an offense again. No one's asking him to be able to to hold, like to uh, carry an offense or put an offense on his shoulders or take more than 10 shots a game. But if he can at least be relied on to hit an open Not shot when he has an open shot, offensively. then yeah, it's, it's hard to imagine him sticking the league, even despite the fact that he's a fantastic defender and a really good facilitator. I mean, he hasn't hit a three in like two weeks. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and to kind of give you a comparison with Rajon Rondo, Rajon Rondo oh. never averaged 14 points a game in his career. Yeah. Like, he, he was never really a scorer, but he did average mm-hmm. almost 12 assists multiple mm-hmm. times. And yeah. he averaged around five, five mm-hmm. and a half to six, even one year, seven and a half rebounds. I mean, he had years where, I mean, if you were to tell me Killian were to develop into a guy that could average 11 points, nine, 10 assists and four to five rebounds a game like that, mm-hmm. that guy can stick around in this league. Yeah. Especially if he's a really good defender. But mm-hmm. then again, looking at it, I don't know if those numbers are going to be realistic for a guy that probably only plays 25 to 30 minutes a game because of his role off the bench. Because mm-hmm. you can't start a guy like that. Not not in today's game. It, it just doesn't work. Yeah. The game is different. So mm-hmm. it, it it's if he's averaging those numbers in 25 to 30 minutes, that, that dude should be an all-star. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was I was just looking back at uh, Killian's game logs, and Killian's only gotten forty points in one game, fourteen points in one game in his career, and that was the game he went off for twenty one towards the end of last season in Chicago. Right, he took seventeen shots that game. He, I feel like he hasn't taken seventeen shots this month, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I know you actually I, might be right. No, he has. <laughs> He had what five five or six shots le- uh, in the game against Charlotte. Mm-hmm. He's taking four. He's taken fourteen shots in the last three games total. Okay, three games combined. So yeah. more than a month or yeah. less than a month. But regardless, like Killian has a path to stay in this league if he mm-hmm. doesn't really develop the shot. It's just going to make it a lot more difficult just because of the way mm-hmm. the game is today. Like he yeah. he he's got to develop that shot to stay in this game. Stay mm-hmm. in this league at least a little bit. A guy you can comfortably dish the ball to when he's the open man and he hits that shot. Yep. You know what I do want to see more of, though, and that he's shown? Uh, I don't know if you saw the play. It's kind of, well, it's been all over Twitter, too, but um, where he crossed over Mason Plumley and then took it right to the rack. Um, I'm not saying specifically the crossover. I'm talking about he took it to the rack and didn't shy from the contact, went by the body. I can't remember who the defender was, and just went strong to the hole. And that's really all I've been asking from Gilly. I mean, goes, he's a big goes, dude. He should be able to go strong to the hole. Don't the be afraid to take contact. <laughs> right. He he should have zero problems absorbing contact near the rim. He's big. Yeah. He's 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 not 
Dame Lillard's six one, one hundred and seventy pounds. Like he's a mm-hmm. big guy, a big guard. Yeah. But um, let's talk about Cade real quick. We mentioned this on the last show, and the trend has been continuing of Cade getting into early heavy foul trouble. Oh yeah. Um, it was he's done very, it in four very of his last five in, games uh, in the game against Boston. Very yep. evident. I, I, there was a good chance you could have won that game if Kate had played more than 27 minutes because of his foul trouble. Yep. Uh, Kate had 25 in 27 minutes. I mean, he could have gone for 40. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Is this worrisome to you at all? I'm going to stick with my thoughts from last time. It, it's mm-hmm. It's a rookie trying to do too much. He, mm-hmm. He's l- learning. He's trying to figure out where he can pick his spots defensively. And right now he doesn't know where he can pick his spots defensively. So he's trying mm-hmm. to do a little too much. He's pressing a little too hard, trying to take over in games. And it, it's causing him to make some mistakes defensively. That's getting him into foul trouble. If he doesn't develop a, a bit more of a head on his shoulders in that regard defensively, then yeah, that's going to worry me because mm-hmm. Yes, he's a good, capable defender, but he's also got to be a smart defender. Mm -hmm. And whereas on the offensive side of the ball, he's incredibly smart. I haven't quite seen that intelligence on the defensive side of the ball just yet. So and that's where I think a lot of the foul trouble is coming from Mm. is he's trying to do a little bit too much. So I'm not quite ready to worry yet. Again, the season Mm. doesn't matter. But if I yeah. start to see it continue into next year, yeah, that's going to worry me because mm-hmm. you can't he can't help this team win if he's not on the floor. Exactly. So he needs to be in these mm-hmm. games and mm-hmm. needs to be able to be available for 35 plus mm-hmm. minutes a game. Mm-hmm. We need him to be. What I find really interesting, though, is like he'll get in early foul trouble and Twin Casey will sit him for a bit. But then like he'll put him in like, let's say middle third, early fourth quarter. And Kate will do a great job, like staying effective, like, like seeing out of foul trouble without really taking himself out of the game defensively. See, I'm, I'm like, so I'm... like, if you, I'm like, if you know how to do that, then why are we getting into so much early foul trouble? <laughs> like, I'm going to disagree with you on the staying effective defensively side, because mm-hmm. in that Boston game in particular, when he came mm-hmm. back in that game with five fouls, he was mm-hmm. a turnstile for Jalen Brown. Jalen mm-hmm. Brown went yeah. around him every single time up and down the floor. Mm-hmm. He literally just turned and threw his arms up and let Jalen Brown get to the rack time after time after time after time in that game. Mm-hmm. And it was, and I mean, I get it. I get why he did it. Like you don't want to be overly aggressive when you have five fouls and you are who you are for your team. But at the same yep. time, Dude, you he he was not effective defensively when he came back in that game. He was straight up a liability on the defense side of the ball. So mm-hmm. bad to the point where they took Dwayne Casey recognized it and took him off Jalen Brown. He he stuck mm-hmm. him on Peyton Pritchard at that point, and Peyton Pritchard still <laughs> abused him a little bit because he took it right to him. Peyton Pritchard's little ass took it to him. <laughs> it took it to Cade, and Cade couldn't stop him because he yeah. was they're, not They're trying aggressive. to get him to fall out. They're like, just they go were, but Cade is guarding. When just they tackle. switched him, they switched Sadiq <laughs> to Jalen Brown, which worked out a little bit. But Peyton yeah. Pritchard was able to go out and put up numbers on, uh, mm-hmm. on Cade. Like, that can't happen. Like, I get he's got five mm-hmm. fouls. I get he can't play as aggressively. He's got to just play smart, though. He's got to still be efficient defensively. And that's where I'm saying I'm disagreeing with you because when he gets into foul trouble, I've seen him become a turnstile multiple times now. And it was extremely prevalent that Boston game. Yeah, I missed that stretch against Boston because I remember. Um, oh, my I was like, God. Why, dude, why isn't, go- I was like, why isn't Kate coming back in? Like, yes, he has five fouls. What's the fourth quarter? At this point, just if he fouls out, he fouls out. Go <laughs> watch the last like- five minutes of that game when Boston yeah. pulls away. It was Jalen mm-hmm. Brown or Peyton Pritchard, whoever was Cade Cunningham was on, up and mm-hmm. down the floor. Like, it, it was bad. Mm-hmm. I, there were times, so many times I watched Cade just kind of throw his arms up like this as the guy's driving right around him because he had, <laughs> because he felt like he had to. Mm. And and I get it, but again, you, you move your feet, stay in front, do yeah, something. Just just play play with your hand. Literally, put your hands on your back and just shuffle in front. <laughs> That's Stop what you gotta do. Fine, don't just turn your shoulders and let them drive right by you. Yeah, because Peyton Pritchard's short ass is doing it to you. Can speaking of, can we talk about the uh, Diallo ejection? <laughs> 
Like, I get it to letter the law. It's okay. You get ejected. Did we have to throw the 20K fine on top of that? <laughs> <laughs> Again, I think that's another letter of the law. You make contact with an official. It's 20, automatic 20K. But refs are so soft, man. <laughs> Did you see the um the pool report? No. I got I to gotta pull it back up. James Edwards is actually the pool reporter for the pool reporter for that game, so he was able to um, get the feedback from the ref on why they ended up ejecting Hamadou. Would have been real nice to have him in the game. Let me tell you, especially oh, yeah. when Cade was in foul trouble. It it started to feel like the st- deck was going to stack against us in that game, but here we go. Um, so first question was, what deemed Hamadou Diallo's contact the official malicious rather than incidental, and? Crew Chief Rodney Mott replied, per rule, any contact with a game official, and in this case, a shove, is deemed a hostile act and an automatic ejection. And then they followed up by asking, do officials have the wiggle room to determine what is a hostile act versus incidental contact? Mott said, yes, in this case, we use replay to confirm that a hostile act had occurred. And then it uh, it had later come out that... Um, that uh, Mott had thought that Diallo was mad at him from or the official. I don't, I'm not sure if it was Mott. Had thought that Diallo was mad at him and from the previous play and thought they did intentionally because he thought that he was mad at him. And I'm like, we can't just inject like your emotion. <laughs> into, See, that's into that's the like, issue I have with a lot of these refs is they they try to be too involved in the game. Mm-hmm. Like they they try yeah. to make it about them, and that's what that is is allowing what you think a player's thoughts are mm-hmm. to dictate how you make a call. Like, like yeah. if it seemed incidental to you because whatever, then call it that way. Don't think, oh, mm-hmm. I think he's mad at me, so that was definitely mm-hmm. a, no. Like just call it as it is. <laughs> Don't put your thoughts into it. You're mm-hmm. a ref. You're meant to be heard and not seen. Like er, yeah. seen and not heard, whatever you want to say. Like you're meant to just be there to officiate the game, not to throw your own emotions and and thoughts into things nobody cares what you think you're a ref <laughs> nobody cares <laughs> so stop acting like anybody does but i i do think the more egregious thing from that game was um i don't know if you saw the isaiah stewart technical foul no, when uh so isaiah stewart was boxing out marcus smart and marcus smart kind of like i guess took offense to the way he was getting boxed out Mark Smart's and got a guy <laughs> and then, like, got all up in Isaiah Stewart's face. And Isaiah Stewart just backed away and walked away. And the, uh, like, George Blaha in the contract, they were, they were, co- they were um, commenting him, saying, like, he's really been trying to clean up his image since the LeBron altercation because he doesn't want that to define who he is in the league. And this, uh, the fact that he just walked away here shows, like, real growth and maturity in him. And this is what he's been working towards from, the, from that point. And then, not a second later, you hear that Isaiah Stewart got teed up, <laughs> and like they and the, like Blaha was like trying to look at the at the replay, like wait, what what's it what's the technical? For? <laughs> he legitimately just walked away. <laughs> so I'm gonna give you a take here, and, and feel yeah. free to trash it, disagree with it, whatever. Mm-hmm. I kind of wish Isaiah Stewart gotten smart back in Smart's face. I, I mean, kind of want him teed up either way. Then uh, well, n- no, it. not even just because of that. I kind of want him to have that reputation. Ah, you want that bad boy reputation. I want that bad boy reputation because mm-hmm. I want the reputation that you can't just punk this team. Mm-hmm. And looking at the teams that have won titles in this town with the bad mm-hmm. boys, with the going to work crew, you know damn well Ben ain't backing down mm-hmm. from Lil mm-hmm. Ass Marcus Smart. Mm-hmm. Like, he, he ain't backing down from him. He's getting right in his face and just laughing at him, telling him to sit the fuck down. Like, he ain't, ta- he ain't backing down from that. <laughs> I don't want to thought- talk to Stewart to either. I thought we were getting uh, the uh, old beef stew when uh, in the end, towards the end of the Charlotte game when he was trying to force that jump ball. Mm-hmm. And he, he was basically swinging the other. I can't remember what player it was. He was like swinging around the ball like after the whistle was blown. He was still so, was, was it PJ that had yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> I thought I was like, come on, all right, let go of the ball, beef. Let go of the ball. <laughs> <laughs> like. I, I want that attitude here. Like, yeah. that's what this town adores. That's what they, you know, that's how we got the beef stew name. That's how we got the, the image in this town that, oh, we could mm-hmm. have the next Ben Wallace here. He could be mm-hmm. that energy guy. And now he's, I feel like that LeBron thing has kind of pushed him away from that because mm-hmm. I think he got too much flack for it. 
Yeah, and no, like, he's like very he, wary of his reputation. He did go a little bit too far with that LeBron yeah. thing, but at the same time, don't lose your edge. The, the, the second charge, I think that was a little too much. <laughs> How about the third? <laughs> but like, don't lose your edge. You know, mm-hmm. don't lose that chip on your shoulder. Don't be Mr. Nice Guy in the league. Don't be afraid mm-hmm. to get in somebody's face still. Don't let people punk you. Yeah. You know, because when it comes down to it, Detroit teams, when, when they're at their best in this town, ain't nobody going to punk this team. And he's got to be kind of a focal point to that. So oh, I, I mean, know, I agree. I, I didn't love him just backing down. I get it. I, you know, I, I'm not mad at it. I just kind of mm-hmm. wish he would. He, he'd be a little bit more willing to get in his face. That's yeah. all. And it's totally a Detroiters mentality of <laughs> you ain't going to push us around. Like it's a total, you know, dirt bag mentality, but you know what? I don't care. That's when our, that's when the Pistons are at their best. You know what, David? That's what we are. <laughs> Damn right. <laughs> Any other comments on these? Uh, on like, are you, are you at all worried about losing draft position? No, this team, I know, so it's, a ta- I know it's a tired discussion, but no, cause this team, I so mean, far we're behind. We're on the cost of slipping to three now. Um, okay. Instead of two behind the Rockets. But yeah, I think we have some cushion between uh, us and four, which I think is OKC. Could be wrong. I'll tell you in a second how close we are. Six, five and a half games behind the Pacers and about four and a half behind the Thunder. So we've got yeah. some room there. Mm-hmm. And we're only. Wait, have the Rockets officially passed us after last night's one? No, we have we have one more loss, so we're a half game behind okay. them. Cool. So if they lose next game, then whoever owns the tiebreaker would have mm-hmm. it. So we are still number two, but we're on the cusp there. But again, two, one, two, three, it doesn't matter. I, I don't think the Pistons are going to end up being better than the Thunder. I think that team's a little bit further along than than we are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but and you either have the way, same odds one, two, and three. You just said, yeah, that's, that's why I said I don't You're care. Risking one, falling two, three. Lower, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> but um, speaking of the draft, I did want to do a little bit of early draft talk. Let's today. do it. Do you have anything to add to nope. current events? Nope. Um, so, the Detroit Bad Boys actually put out volume one of their big board. Okay. And I'm just curious to see if you agree with it. Okay. Let's hear it. So, number one on their big board is Jabari Smith. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. I, I remember I said on this podcast, it was at least a month ago, that I felt like Jabari Smith was kind of separating himself from the rest of the pack. I feel like I'm the only one that's shrunk back on Jabari Smith since then. <laughs> He's still... I still love Jabari Smith, and I think he's a beautiful fit with the Pistons. It's just the the longer this whole lack of playing down low goes on, the more I'm starting to wonder what his role would be on the team. Dominant. It, it's a guy who you can trust to do whatever you need. Like, it, mm. sure, he doesn't. He maybe he doesn't have a lethal post game, but. If he's outside hitting a ton of threes or hitting turnaround mid range J's, who get who cares? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I mean, what are you upset about? <laughs> you're not you're not wrong. Um, and and the fact that he can facilitate fairly well for a big man, and it just in terms of his shot creation, like you can't really expect a big man to be that much of a shot creator, but serviceable. And obviously, we have the facilitators to get him his open looks either way. So, right. but yeah, I just want to see the offense be less one, a little bit less one dimensional. Become like, and it's so weird because when you talk about a six ten player having a one dimensional skill set on you offense, think he's post only. Exactly. Well, I mean, <laughs> thinking so- about it. <laughs> Guys like Kevin Love were kind of one dimensional for a while too. Like they were, and he's a better a prospect shooter. than Kevin Love ever was because he's exactly significantly better than Kevin Love as on on the defensive end. I mean, right. what's what's better than zero? Anything? Because Kevin Love <laughs> made his money from the three from the three point line and from that turnaround baseline Jay that he had that yeah. nobody could stop. 
It was that typical white guy power forward turnaround mid range J that nobody's ever been able to figure out. Dirk started it. Kevin Love continued it. Nobody's ever been able to figure that shot out, defensively mm-hmm. speaking. Yeah. But I mean, again, I, I, Jabari Smith, in my opinion, is the number one prospect. He, he's not even 19 years old, averaging over 21 points and almost nine boards a game with three, uh, two and a half assists, one and a half blocks, one and a half steals. Like, mm-hmm. Those numbers are pretty damn good. <laughs> um, number two on the big board, Chet Holmgren. He's averaging 19 points, 13 boards, 4.7 blocks per game, about as many assists as Jabari at two and a half, and almost he's, a steal a game. He's seven feet tall and 195 pounds. Like, what yes. the hell? <laughs> um, that's really... The only hole I can poke in Chet Holmgren's game is he's still way too damn skinny. But he's shooting 74% from the field, um, 46% from three on 3.3 tries a game. He's projected, he's uh, he's looking like he's going to be an elite shot blocker. Obviously, he can score down low. He can space the floor. He's a highly competitive player. I, I think as long as... This goes the way, and I was like, this goes the way of guys like KD or Giannis when they were coming to the league. They were both also super skinny. Obviously, those are exceptions, not the rule. But if he can either A, put more weight on this frame, or B, prove somehow that it's going to be a non factor, I think he's far and away the number one pick. But for now, I, I do feel like that's the reason he's number two on the big board, even though I personally am willing to take the shot and make him number one. But Curious what you think. So I, I see a lot of comparisons with Chad Holmgren to guys like Evan Mobley, who, again, I don't mm-hmm. think he's as quick defensively as as mm-hmm. moving as Mobley is. So I don't love that comparison. I see people say, oh, Kevin Durant's tall and skinny. Well, Kevin Durant's 240 pounds. Yeah. He ain't I don't that like skinny. The, you just watch, like, <clears throat> you, you throw the Kevin Durant comparison just watching the game. It's, it's a completely different game with Chad right. Holmgren than it is to Kevin. And, not saying that any better or worse. It's just a completely different type of player. And people always said, oh, Rudy Gobert's skinny. He's 235 pounds. Like, he ain't that skinny. Yeah. Like, Chad Holmgren has, like, it, he has to add weight to his frame because. <laughs> Unlike so the different the thing is is when it comes to college ball and and with where he plays at Gonzaga in a conference where there's not exactly a whole lot of seven footers in that league, let alone seven footers with seven with a seven five wingspan that can yeah. move out to the perimeter. Mm-hmm. So he's not exactly playing against similar competition. Get into the NBA, there's seven footers galore and seven footers galore that can move he probably is going to struggle a little bit against guys like that. Kevin Durant can defend him. Giannis Antetokounmpo can defend him. Like Mm -hmm. he doesn't really have anybody in college ball that can defend him. So yeah, his numbers are going to look great. He never has a hand in his face because there's nobody that can put one in his face in the NBA. There's a lot of players that can put a hand in his face that would probably make it very uncomfortable for him to shoot the ball. And God mm-hmm. forbid they put a body on him. He may break. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I love what Chad Holmgren's, Holmgren's talent is. I love what he brings to the floor. But unless he adds weight to that frame and show that he can shoot with hands in his face that are similar in stature to him or bigger than him. I love the prospect, but my God, does he scare the hell out of me? <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely an inherent risk. Involved. In my yes. opinion, he's the biggest. He's probably got the biggest question. He's got the highest ceiling and the lowest mm-hmm. floor in my mind of all these prospects. Because, mm-hmm. again, I, he he's what Gonzaga plays in what? The Big East? Mm-hmm. I'm not that great with divisions. I, I so can't I even tell you. remember. <laughs> The West Coast Conference, not the Big East. Sorry, the West mm-hmm. Coast Conference. Let's see. Who else is in the West Coast Conference? BYU. Why is... Oh, yeah. Uh, Loyola Marymount. Mm-hmm. Pepperdine. You know, the, the powerhouse Pepperdine school. Uh, St. Mary's, that's a good team right there. But how many of these schools are, are putting out a seven-footer that has a 7'5 wingspan? Mm-hmm. I'd wager none. And I know they play more than just a conference schedule, but... 14 of his 27 games have been in conference. So, like, yeah, I, I like what the guy brings. I like the talent that's there. I like the potential. I love the potential. 
and I love the talent. But it's he's gonna be seeing a a guy every single game that can defend him, versus in college he sees it a handful of times in the entire year, and that's what concerns me about him as a prospect because uh, of the he, frame there. But the the counter argument to that though is the fact that he's so versatile that he's going to draw attention, focus attention from a defense and. Even if he doesn't um, end up providing you too much offense in a certain game, he's going to draw so much temp- attention on the offensive side of the ball that's going to open things up for you. Massively. See, and here's what I say to that: What if he doesn't shoot at the same clip anymore because he's got then a, a seven foot hand in his face? If the shooting itself doesn't translate, then that's a different well, story. That's I was, my, I was that, just talking that about that is my primary concern: guys. is this dude has never shot a basketball with a hand in his face because nobody can put one in his face. <laughs> There is he is absolutely has zero threat to having a shot blocked right now. Zero. Mm-hmm. In the NBA, he'll never not have the threat. Mm-hmm. And that's what like that right there. And, and, and I read the stat. He shoots 74 percent on twos. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. wonderful. But nobody can touch him. Nobody can. I mean, it's very, it's very like, true. Put a hand in his face. Does he still shoot 75 percent? Most likely not. Mm-hmm. So if the shot doesn't continue to fall at the same clip because he's seeing actual defense that can play against him, well, then how much attention is he actually going to get? Not much. And frankly, I don't think there's a lot of teams in the league that are going to be scared about a dude who weighs 195 pounds at seven feet tall, because all you got to do is put a body on him. I'll muscle him. I'll tell you right now, Rudy Gobert would eat this man alive at that, at that frame. Rudy Gobert, seven foot two, hundred or seven uh, with a seven six wingspan, two hundred and thirty five pounds. He'd eat Chet Holmgren for breakfast. I want to know how much like history we have with these exact measurables in college versus like what they were able to bulk up to in the NBA. Like, I, I'm curious how much history we have on that, if at all. I, like Anthony Davis is similar, but I think Anthony Davis is still considerably bigger than. Chad Giannis Holmgren, is similar. Example. He was really skinny when he came into the league, but I still think he was considerably bigger. I'm trying to look up what Gobert was, but I even feel like he was considerably bigger. What did what did AD weigh in college? Yeah, Gobert was 238 pounds. AD. I he tried to go on NBA Draft that net, but they didn't. They're not listing his weight. <laughs> really? Oh, here we go. 214 pounds. So he's a good 20 pounds. 20 pounds heavier. Yeah. And then he added. And what? Do you, what is he now? 250. Now, yeah, yeah, he's probably he's at least 250. Right. He bulked up, so he bulked up a lot but again. I, I'm not saying Chet Holmgren can't do it because I, I do think he can, and I do think he will because he's gonna have to. Mm-hmm. I love Chet Holmgren and I'd be happy with the pick, but whoa, I'd be scared. Like, like that, that's a do or die pick right there, yeah. And I get you got to make the do or die picks when it comes to winning titles. The Bucks did it with Giannis, and look at where they are now. Mm-hmm. That's a do or die pick. And I love the pick. I love the player. I love what he brings to the game. There are some things he's got to work with, though. You know, yeah. he's got to build build a frame. And he's got to show that he yeah. can hit the, you know, I sure hope, at least in practice, they're taking brooms and putting them in up high so to try to give him a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't nobody um, reaching that high. Number three on Detroit Bad Boys Big Board. This guy's been kind of slipping on my own big board here, and it's, Paulo Banchero, and I, I, he slipped to four for me, actually. But um, here they have him at three. Uh, he's averaging 19 points, nine boards, three and a half assists a game, as well as a block and a steal. But it's I think the reason that he's been slipping for me is I have a lot of questions about what he can bring on the defensive end of the ball, unlike the first two prospects that we just talked about. And, yeah, he's he's kind of a – do it all scorer. There's not much else to his game outside of that. Outside of just scoring. I'm gonna pause you there and, mm-hmm. and say, what the hell is wrong with the do it all scorer? <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> like you say that like but, it's a bad thing. Yeah, oh, that's a, all he has to his game. Oh, there's a re- yeah, there's a reason he's a top five pick, but I'm comparing him to Jabari Smith. No, Chet Holmgren I, I and Jaden Ivey just, coming up. Because like, <laughs> you're not the only one he's slipping down boards for, and mm-hmm. I'm actually agreeing with you. He is my number four prospect. But mm-hmm. people say that, oh, he he's only a do-it-all scorer as a prospect. Like, it's a bad thing. 
<laughs> like, we have a lot of do-it-all scorers in this league that are very, very good players. So it ain't exactly a bad thing that he can be a do-it-all scorer. And, again, defensive... And I'm in the belief that defensive, you know, how good of a defender you are Mm -hmm. has a lot to do with effort and a lot to do with Mm -hmm. intelligence. Yeah. So it's something that you can develop in this Mm -hmm. league. But, um, no, I I mean, I agree with that. But also, when you talk about scoring, he he is capable of scoring at all three levels. But, like, what I'm trying to get at is, like, when you're almost exclusively a scorer, you at least have to be super efficient on that end of the ball. Meanwhile, Panchero is shooting like 31% from three-point range. Uh, he's He doesn't distribute the rock. Well, he has lately, but at least... I was going to say, he's so I'm, I'm not gonna, half assists. Yeah, That's I'm not gonna, Jabari Smith's got. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to knock him too much for that. It, he's earlier a better in his facilitator career, than Jabari Smith. Yeah, yeah earlier in his college career, um, he was, but he's picked it up lately. What do you mean um, earlier? He's a freshman. And I'm seeing earlier in the season. Huh. Well, I mean, especially let him get some time with his teammates. Yeah, especially his last game, he had nine assists against Syracuse. Like, but, I, I'm not gonna, um, I'm not gonna put a, a black check or black X mm-hmm. on his facilitation. I yeah. think he's a fine facilitator at six ten. But um, I, I will knock the efficiency. That's uh, fair. Again, when you're a do it all scorer, or, or sorry, I should say when you are almost exclusively a scorer, I need to see better shooting percentages and I just when I'm picking that high in a draft I just want someone to contribute on both ends of the floor I mean that's like see <laughs> I don't know that like okay I'm gonna be straight with you Chet Holmgren is he gonna contribute defensively at 195 pounds yeah I'm gonna disagree with you I'm gonna say that guys like Kevin Durant are gonna put him on his ass he's at the very least going to be a very high level, if not a lead shot blocker. And when he gets abused for 25 points otherwise, that matters. <laughs> and it, like, the, never, the fact like, that you're seven feet tall, seven five wingspan, just put your hands up and you're already being affected. Okay, until defense. somebody <laughs> puts contact into you and you break. Like, it, it, you can't, like, I, guys who are that small aren't good defensively for a reason. Like, Yes, I get he's seven feet tall with a seven five wingspan, but when you only weigh 195 pounds, you can't stop from getting back down. How effective are you going to be when you get back down so far your hand is through the hoop? I really like Chet Holmgren as a player, but I think people look at him as the player that he is now going up against people that don't compare. It's like putting the six foot five kid on the eighth grade basketball team. There's no, yeah, he looks amazing because there's nobody that can touch him. That's what we have here. (laughs) College basketball doesn't have anything that compares except for the Jabari Smiths. Well, guess what? I don't think he's played him (laughs) or the Paolo Banchero. Guess what? I don't think he's played him. The tournament for Chet Holmgren is going to be extremely important. I I do think Chet Holmgren would eat Paolo Banchero live if Banchero was guarding him, but (laughs) Paolo Banchero weighs 250 pounds. Yeah, but he is. Paolo Banchero can stay in front of him. That's the problem. He ain't getting back (laughs) down. I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying that Chet Holmgren's got to prove that he's got an ability to score and and be as good of a player against elite tier defense. So so is Banchero your two or is Holmgren your two? Holmgren is my two. Like, don't get me wrong. I I think the potential that's there and weight can be added a hell of a lot easier Mm -hmm. than defensive ability. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a big difference there. I'm just... I can't knock, like, I can't just sit here and say honestly that I think Chet Holmgren's entire game is going to translate to the league if he doesn't add to his frame. Mm-hmm. If he doesn't add 30, 40 pounds to that frame, he's going to get beat up in the league. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine a guy like Al Horford or somebody look, making him look bad because he can't defend him? Mm-hmm. Granted, Horford's like, are, are 100, you- but still. Really going to pass up the opportunity like that type of player just no. on the chance that he can't add to his I frame? I said he's my number two. Okay. But again, <laughs> if he doesn't add to his frame, I don't think Chet Holmgren's going to be very effective in this league. Mm-hmm. I don't. Because he's going to get bodied mm-hmm. repeatedly. But we're we're talking about Banchero now. <laughs> I know. I'm just saying, I don't remember what we were talking about. But regardless, when it comes to a guy like Paolo Banchero, looking at the numbers, I'm not mad at the 46% shooting from the field. The 32 mm-hmm. or 31% from three definitely has to come up. Mm-hmm. Definitely has to come up. 
especially if he's going to be a scoring threat. You know, mm-hmm. if he's a guy who can only score and not do well, he can also facilitate. But if he's an offensive powerhouse, taking him that high in the draft, yeah, I, I do need him to at least be an effective and efficient scoring powerhouse. So mm-hmm. I'm not going to not I'm not going to say that I'm not going to take him in the top five because he can't play defense. Dude, it, look at half the guys that are taken in the top mm-hmm. five and are stars in this league. None of them play defense. Like it, it, those players are all over the place that are stars. Yeah. So it, the defense doesn't really bother me as oh. long as the shooting efficiency is there. <laughs> don't the don't get me. He has to be there. Don't, don't get me wrong. I've said before and I'll say it again that uh, I am happy anywhere in the top four of this draft. Right. But you <laughs> did say just five minutes ago that if you're yeah, taking him in the top five, me. you want him to take You want him to be able to play on both sides of the ball. Yeah. And I'm sitting here telling you, I don't care if he can play defense. If the dude's mm-hmm. going to make, you know, be an efficient, legit powerhouse score. I don't mm-hmm. care if he can play defense at that point. I'll figure it mm-hmm. out. <laughs> <laughs> um, moving on to my number three, Detroit Bad Boys number four on their big board is Jay and Ivy. Uh, also my number three. Guard out of Purdue. Another guy that we know he can score. I mean, there's no question about at this point that the kid can score at all three levels. The big question mark around Jay and Ivy up to this point, and specifically for Pistons purposes, is can he play off ball? So can he coexist if Cade is your primary point guard? And right now the jury's out, and really it's just because of the role he has in Purdue's offense. I mean, in Purdue's offense, he's a primary ball handler, and that's not going to change any point this season. So I don't know how fair it is to completely knock his draft stock if you're a Pistons fan on the idea that maybe he can't play off ball. Because, I mean, we haven't really seen him get the opportunity to play off ball. He um, has, however, At least not from what I've seen. He has <laughs> shown an ability to be able to catch and shoot very well, mm-hmm. which is something I think is is a huge piece that could be big to mm-hmm. add alongside Cade Cunningham is the ability mm-hmm. to, to catch and shoot at a high level. And Jaden mm-hmm. Ivey's shown that ability to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. So that that's a key piece right there. He's got to be able to show that he can move and find the right space in the floor off ball. That's more of the question mark, mm-hmm. at least in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I do think the re- the very real question mark on the offensive side of the ball is, um, and I, I do think it's part of the reason that you do get this, can he play off ball kind of uh, story that, that surrounds him is the fact that at least from this season, it has looked like he needs the volume to have the offensive production. But again, at the same time, until I see a situation where he's not getting the volume and is completely ineffective, I don't know how comfortable I am passing up Jane Ivy on, on just conjecture alone. I mean, again, here's another thing where I'm like, what young guy doesn't need the volume to be a, a good mm-hmm. score? Cade needs yeah. volume to be a good score. He's shooting 40% from the field. Like mm-hmm. it, it, a lot of players need young players in particular need the volume to be effective scorers. Mm-hmm. And Jaden Ivy is no different. And as the efficiency gets better throughout the time in the league, I also think the opportunity to play alongside a guy like Cade Cunningham is going to up that efficiency. Mm-hmm. He's going to find more open shots. He's going to be able to take, his guy one-on-one quite a bit more often than he would than he, than he currently does at Purdue because of the fact that he's drawing all the attention of defenses right now and produce in, in, in Purdue's games. But if he's playing alongside Cade, guess what? You can't ignore the other guy. And if you di- decide to focus on those two and ignore Sadiq, he can kill you too. Like there there's mm-hmm. the Pistons will have a nucleus here that can actually you can't just ignore one of them. Yeah. Because it's a problem if you do, because they one of those three will beat you. And that, so, that's what I love about the top four of this draft is all four guys are scorers. Like Yes, absolutely. They are. <laughs> like the top four in this draft fit exactly what the Pistons need. Oh yeah. They need a big man that can score. Guess what? There's mm-hmm. three of them. They need a guard that can score. Guess what? There's one of those two. Like it it, it fits what we need. And mm-hmm. I know I, I spent a lot of time talking about how I'm worried about Chet Holmgren. He is the highest ceiling of all of these prospects in my mind. You could be looking mm-hmm. at the next Kevin Durant with Chet Holmgren, it, but maybe even better offense. I don't know. 
You could be looking at the next unicorn type player which had home a guy who handles the ball like a point guard but is seven foot tall and is a seven foot five wingspan we that's unheard of like yeah. again like that that you don't those guys don't exist often and i know the term unicorn is way overutilized now but that quite literally is the <laughs> definition of it oh yeah there's he's a unicorn if i've ever seen one i mean <laughs> so the the possibility of landing one of the jabari smith chad holmgren's Jaden ivy's or paulo bancheros in this draft that's why I've long said my expectations change with this team when we get this draft pick. My mm-hmm. expectations become, all right, it's go time. If you're not winning or competing for titles within two years, what are we doing here? Because yeah. you now will have had two top five picks, a top, what was Sadiq, 16 or was that Isaiah Stewart? I think it was 19. 19. Another top 20 pick in, in Sadiq Bay. This team's supposed to be good very soon. And you adding a guy like Jabari Smith, Chad Holmgren, Jaden Ivey, Paolo Banchero, it's sooner rather than later with this team. Mm -hmm. You don't get a lot of time when you've got two number one picks. Sorry. Moving on to... expectations become very high. (laughs) Where where is he on your big board, by the way? Jaden Ivey. Number three. Jaden Ivey. He's three. He's three on your big board. Yes. Okay. And and in honesty, like, yeah, he's three. Because I I like Jabari Mm -hmm. Smith and Chad Holmgren better. I mm-hmm. want it like in most years, Jay Nivey would probably be number two on my big board. But the presence mm-hmm. of guys like Holmgren and, and Smith, just I, I can't ignore that. Um, number five on the Detroit Bad Boys big board. And five and six have flipped back and forth for me pretty consistently at this point. But right now, number five on the Bad Boys big board is AJ Griff. You want a shooter? <laughs> this dude's a shooter. Yes, um, he's a shooter. <laughs> he's a. Six four, two hundred pounds. I've got six guard. six. Sorry, yeah, sorry, six six. I I don't know why I was just reading um, J Nine's <laughs> measurables. <laughs> six six, two hundred ten pound um, shooting guard slash small forward out of Duke. He shoots what forty seven percent from the three point line, if I'm not mistaken, and it's and he can defend at a high level thanks to the fact that he is built like a damn linebacker. <laughs> Yeah, 222 pounds and six foot six. The only thing with him that I do feel like he's going, I just, I don't know if he's going to be anything more than a complimentary type player. I mean, he's taken on more volume as the season goes on at Duke. Just out of curiosity, and, where is uh, Detroit Bad Boys getting their stat numbers for him from? Oh, I have no idea. I'm using ESPN. I was going to say, because ESPN's got him averaging 10 points a game. Uh, he's definitely averaging more than that, at least lately. <laughs> but just last six games, he's put up 20, 13, 15, 12, 10, 12. Right. He's had games, other games, 27, 22, 22. Yeah, 20, 21, yeah. 20, 22, and 29 games, 10.4 points mm-hmm. per game, 3.7 boards, 1.1 assists. He's yeah. shooting 49% from three. Exactly, yeah. He's shooting 49% <laughs> from three. Um his volume, if you look at that game log, his volume has gone up considerably from the early season, and that's when his scoring has gone up. So, and that's why I I wish I had a higher sample size of him playing with a high volume. Just I just want to know if he can be a go-to scorer or not. I know he, ha- he has the efficiency numbers to do it, but can he keep it up in a high volume role? He's looking. He's starting to look like he can. He's he's taking double digit shots in most of his last 10, 15 games. I like AJ Griffin a lot, man. There, there's not many holes to poke in this guy's game. No, there's not. He's definitely a really good shooter. Um, what would what did you say his game log was? I mean, like over the last six. What, yeah, last, last five? five. Give me last five. He had 20 points against Syracuse on the 26th. He had 13 points against okay. Virginia, 15 points okay. against Florida All right. State. We're looking at the same yeah. thing then. Okay. Yeah, no, I he I I like the I player. can't say I've actually watched a game of his yet. I need I still need to watch him play. I like the way but. he plays the game. Like I he's obviously a lights out shooter from outside, which is something that's extremely mm-hmm. important to have, but mm-hmm. I don't know. Like it's the fit isn't quite as there for me. Yes, every team needs a shooter, but I feel like he's a role playing shooter. He's not a guy that is going to create his own shot and take like when we draft this high in a draft, we're looking for a guy that can be a number two guy here. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? 
And I just I don't necessarily see that with with AJ Griffin. I see him as being a number three shooting option or something along those lines, a role guy. I I, I do get a, I honestly get a lot of Sadiq Bay from <laughs> like um, I, I don't think that's too far off of a comparison for AJ no. Griffin. I think the the main knock on him is just the injury concerns. He's been yeah pretty consistently injured over the last few years, but again he's been able to play most of the season. So the other guy that flip flops between AJ Griffin uh, is Shaden Sharp. Now you want to talk about maybe the riskiest pick of this draft. Yes, it's, absolutely. It's Shaden Sharp, particularly because he is not played and will not be playing a single college basketball game. Now, that's the nope. chance to declare for the draft. We don't even know if he de- he's going to declare for the draft at this point. But the fact of the matter is he reclassed into this draft class. He was projected as a top three pick next year, um, if not the number one overall pick. Which makes you and, curious why he decided to reclassify to be eligible for this draft. Because, like, he probably would have made more money by just staying. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I'm operating on the assumption he's going to declare. Because I don't see why he would have reclassified if he wasn't going to play for the draft a year earlier. Right. So, you're talking entirely potential with Shaden Sharp. But the guy is super athletic. He's a shot creator. I don't want to say super athletic, but he's got hops at least. Um, yeah, he looked athletic against high schoolers. Let's see. <laughs> Again, going like back here. to that six foot five and eighth grade <laughs> comparison. He's got upside uh, with his shot. He's got defensive upside, but that word is what you're going to keep hearing with Shane Sharp is upside because upside all and you potential. all you have on him is high school film. Now knowing that. He was at least projected as a top three pick, and you're, you could potentially be getting a steal, if you, depending on how you look at it, if you fall to, like, five or six. Is Shane Sharp a guy that intrigues you, or do you just kind of stay away knowing how little we I'll know be honest with you. Guys who are pure, mm-hmm. like, projects, they don't work out in this town. Mm-hmm. And we've got some sample size that goes along with that. Look at Darko. He didn't work out. Granted, he sucked to begin with. But Mm -hmm. look at guys like Sekou Dumboya. He was a project that didn't work out. Henry Ellenson. He was a project who didn't work out. Mm -hmm. Like, Like, the Pistons have drafted a lot of projects who just have not panned out in this town. I'm not saying Shaden Sharp won't. You're pushing the timeline further down the road with a guy like Shaden Sharp, and I don't necessarily want to do that. I think I agree with you there. So you actually did miss a guy um, that mm-hmm. they have listed right behind A.J. Griffin and actually mm. at number five. Or sorry, at number six. At number six, sorry. yeah. And it's Benedict Mathurin from Yeah, the, the reason Arizona. I brought Shane Sharp is because I was saying I flip-flop all the time right. on my – yeah, that's why. But, um, um, but yeah, Benedict Mathurin. He's got – he's 6'7", 195 uh, as a sophomore for Arizona. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's a little bit older, but – He's a guy who's got high level athleticism. He's an explosive guard and hits open shots from downtown and he's able to play off ball and be effective very at a high level, which is something that I think is going to be important in whoever we get as a guy who can play off ball effectively. He he looks like he has a potential to be a high level defender. He I mean he's he's a high impact player uh, on on in the Arizona basketball team. So and looking at what his skill sets are, they fit very nicely with the Pistons. But again, I think in Mathurin's case a lot like AJ Griffin's case, you're looking at more of a role guy here. A guy who we tell, you know, he he's not going to necessarily take over games for the Pistons and that may be what they're looking to get in this draft. So if they do get unlucky, maybe you do go with a shade and sharp and take a shot at it. I don't know. But not saying Benedict Mathurin isn't a good player, or a great player, because he is. But I don't know if he's able to be that like top tier, like that take over the game type of guy. I mean, I mean he, even he's a scorer. Uh, he is. Let's not get that wrong. <laughs> he is. But again, he's a role type scorer. Like he, he's mm-hmm. a guy who plays off ball. He he's you know, he's he's a guy who mm-hmm. You probably need somebody to facilitate the ball to him because he plays off ball very well. He can absolutely score. But, like, 
here's here's a good sentence that uh apparently Brady Fredrickson has has labeled him with. Mm-hmm. His tools of production equal a very good NBA player. That sounds a lot like Sadiq Bay. And Sadiq Bay is mm-hmm. not a guy who can take over a game as often as you as you would hope for yeah. whoever we get at the in this draft. Because they still need a true number two guy, and I don't think Sadiq's gonna be in that role. I like Sadiq in the role he's in at at the number three guy. Mm-hmm. Or Technically, he's number two right now, but I'd, I'd like to see Sadiq in that number three role to have a guy like whoever at mm-hmm. the number two that can take over games alongside Cade. Now, yeah. if Sadiq takes his game to another level, that's a completely different story, and we're not even talking about this anymore. Mm-hmm. But again, I, I like Benedict Mathurin's game. He fits with this team mm-hmm. really well. I just don't quite think that the ceiling is, is where I want it to be for the Pistons mm-hmm. to add to. That's all. But yeah. again, if they're falling outside the top four, maybe they got to go with a guy like that. Yeah. Oh, like I'll be honest. Like his his measurables are slightly different to this player, but I I do see a lot of Oladipo in um, Benedict Mathurin's game. That's fair. Now, Oladipo, I feel like could have been a much better player in the NBA if if not for injuries. But I was going to say he <laughs> it wasn't fault of his own; it was injury. But yeah, exactly. So, but again. You're either way. I think you're looking at effective two guard. Yeah, uh, I think it's the more I watch him, the more I'm like, this is what we're hoping Hamadou becomes. <laughs> like, yeah, it is, and, uh, and he's shown signs of it a little bit. Yeah. Granted, he's a hell of a lot better shooter than Hamadou. D- That's what I'm saying. This is what we're hoping he progresses to. <laughs> right. But yeah, no, I I do like Benedict Mathurin a lot, and I think his spot on the big board is justified absolutely i don't want to get too far into it um those yeah are those are the those are really the guys the that i know spots that we that the about. Pistons could potentially land as of right yep. now so mm-hmm. um anything else to add before we close out here no all right that is in a call for this week guys thank you for listening we will catch you next week uh follow us on twitter at real fan report andrew thank you for joining me thank you to Detroit sports podcast as always have a good one guys this has been the fan reporters by fans for fans We'll catch you guys next week. Enjoy it. Have a good one. Peace out. Peace.